Hello, I'm Stuart Childs and you're welcome to the Dairy Age, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. With more people being employed directly on farms than in the past, legislation around weekly hours, minimum pay and holiday entitlements to name only a few are all areas that farmers need to be aware of. With that in mind, I spoke to Clarissa O'Nulon, HR Services Manager with IFAC, about key elements farmers need to know when employing people in their farm businesses. I started by asking Clarissa to explain the importance and risks for employers associated with employment contracts. In Ireland, every employer must give the core terms of employment to their employee within five days of that employee starting employment. So that includes 10 or more core terms. And the employer then has one month to issue the remaining terms of employment. This recently changed on the 16th of December. So it used to just be five core terms of employment. So things are constantly changing and it's difficult to stay on top of these changes. What we would recommend doing is issue a contract of employment before the employee starts with all the core and the remaining terms and conditions so that you just issue this contract once and you cover yourself. The WRC will If you are experiencing a WRC audit, they will ask for contracts of employment for all employees. And if you don't have a contract of employment for everyone, you could be looking at a fine of up to €2,000. And your employees could also put a complaint in against you as well. So I suppose the big fear, as I said, with people coming onto a farm for the first time uh, is maybe how good are they? Are they the right person for that job? So and and the big fear that's always there probably is like, can I actually get rid of this person without retribution or come back on me? Um, So there is a probation period, which is in the legislation again. Will you just explain what that is and I suppose what protection that gives to the employer? Because uh, a lot of people would be concerned that there's no protection for the employer in in a lot of these cases. But this would be uh, one of the forms, I suppose, of protection for them. Exactly. So it's a period of time that's usually six months at the beginning of the employment where the employer can assess whether the employee is suitable for the job or not. So sometimes employers might say or think, oh, I better not put anything in writing yet. I'll do a trial period with them first and see if they're suitable or not. Not only is this illegal, you're putting risk on the business as well. So include a probationary period in the contract of employment and this will essentially be your trial period and then you have six months to see if this employee is working out or not. Now there's also some changes there to the minimum wage of late now and as as we said in our discussions in in advance of of this um, podcast that we would be expecting that not too many people will be on the minimum wage or we'd be hoping that not too many people will be on the minimum wage or the likelihood of them staying around is going to be slim. But young people will be at a minimum requirement. We'll say there's different age categories for the different minimum pays and people will be availing of young people coming onto the farm. Um, So what is the new minimum wage for people so that they're aware of that? So since the 1st of January 2023, the new minimum wage is 11.30 per hour. So it's really important that employers review their wages to ensure that they are compliant with that. And then some people can get sub minimum rates. So these are people who would be under 20 or people who might be part of an apprenticeship program. So there are different rates then based on the age category. And I suppose best advice there is obviously to talk to your own accountants to make sure that you're paying the the right uh, level that you should be paying. Because is there a, a, a case if you're not paying the right level that you could be at fault? there as well yeah absolutely yeah okay so the big uh, the big concern i suppose in um, in agriculture as well as as well as the concern about will this person be up to it is obviously huge hours of work to be worked over the next number of uh, weeks and and maybe the next month or two in particular i suppose where there's a really heavy workload the, there's a there are a minimum kind of uh, maximum working hours per week and so forth but how does that change how does that differ maybe from other sectors with agriculture there are kind of exemptions around it but at the same time there's still statutory requirements too so will you just explain both the recording of the hours and the actual maximum hours that people are supposed to work in a week so the maximum hours of work that an adult employee can work in an average working week is 48 hours. So this doesn't mean that an employee can never work over the 48 hours, but it's the average that's really important here. So usually this average is calculated over a four month period, but in the case of the agri sector, it can be calculated over a six month period. So you need to take out time spent on breaks, on annual leave or sick leave. Um, it doesn't include those 
hours. Um, and again, if you have an employee who is under 18, different rules apply to this. So um, in terms of recording working hours, this is an obligation on the employer as well. If the WRC come in for an audit, they will request to see timesheets or to see records of working hours. So it's really important that employers keep records of daily hours worked. So this includes start and finish times, break taken and our breaks taken and any annual leave. Okay, and what's the situation then, Clarissa, if somebody's on a salary as opposed to being paid on an hourly rate? Are they still obliged to record hours or what's the situation there? Yeah, they would be because their hours may still vary, especially if within the agri-sector, um, if it's a seasonal business, some weeks you might work more hours than others, but they might still be paid a salary. So it's really important to record those working hours. So um, we have a new public holiday in the month of February, so that's obviously something that people will have to consider uh, there's also the whole annual leave piece and then there's also new sick leave pay that people need to be con uh, aware of as well. So will you uh, enlighten us in, in that area, please? Yeah, so there are now 10 public holidays in Ireland. So the new one is on the first Monday in February. So this year it's uh, February the 6th. Um, <clears throat> employees are entitled to benefit for public holidays so there are different rules around um full-time and part-time employees and how they benefit but every employee is entitled to benefit for the public holiday employees also accrue annual leave based on hours worked so this is also applicable for full-time and part-time employees and depending on time worked employees holiday entitlements should be calculated by one of three different methods. So the first one would be four working weeks in a leave year in which the employee works at least 1,365 hours. The second one is a third of the working week per calendar month. And the third one is 8% of the hours that an employee works in a leave year. And all of those are subject to a maximum of four working weeks. So this would depend on which would give the employee the most benefit. That's how you would go about calculating it. And then they will say the, the, the sick leave section then? Yeah, the Sick Leave Act came in in the 1st of January this year. So there is now statutory, now all employees in Ireland have a statutory entitlement to sick pay leave. So all employees, both part-time and full-time, are entitled to it. They are entitled to three days sick pay per year and this can be taken consecutively or non-consecutively. Uh, an employee becomes entitled to this after th 13 weeks of continuous service and they must give a medical certificate to avail of it. For each of the three days we'll say they have to have medical notification of it, they can't just be sick as such. Exactly. And uh, just then on the sick leave paid in Clarissa, just outline that a little bit further please. So the daily rate of payment under this act is 70% of regular earnings up to a maximum of 110 euro per day. This is also set to increase in the future. So there are plans to increase this to five days in year two, seven days in year three, and then a total of 10 days per year in year four. So that's by 2027. So we're looking at 10 days of certified sick leave, basically, is what you're talking about there. It's what's proposed at the moment, yes. Okay, okay. So um, just coming to the notice period then, Clarissa, I suppose it's obviously important for both employers and employees. It just seems from what I've seen, there can be a bit of variation maybe between industries and so forth. What's the statutory requirements there and uh, where should this be notified to people? So all contracts of employment should state the notice period that each party should give on the termination of employment. However, the legislation actually also sets out the minimum periods of notice that must be observed by either party on termination of employment. So this depends on the employee's length of service. If you have worked 13 weeks to two years, it's one week's notice. Two to five years is two weeks notice. Five to 10 years is four weeks notice. 10 to 15 years is six weeks notice. And anything over 15 years is eight weeks notice. OK, so it's actually quite short for um, short, ter short term employees, we'll say. Exactly. So a contract of employment can state longer notice periods, but not less than the statutory, statutory okay. minimum. So if as an employer you want to include a longer notice period, you can include that. So that would be an important point for farmers, obviously, especially in spring calving herd situations where you're going to be quite dependent on that help that you would actually re request that they would give you more notice, obviously, that you wouldn't uh, look for that 
or state that very early on so that it's not when a person says I want to leave that you're telling them that you have to serve this notice that you make it quite clear to them that they'll have to give you at least you're probably looking at two two three four weeks ideally I suppose because it's not going to be easy to replace a person at that time of year either like exactly once you can justify the reasoning behind why you want to increase the 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 notice period and once it's in a contract of employment and both parties are clear at the beginning it can it'll formalize that employment relationship and um reduce disputes later on yeah that's a very important point um so then i suppose the the like dairy farmers have probably made use of part-time help through the, the likes of the farm relief uh, for many many years uh, obviously from your perspective in IFAC you've obviously uh, you see more and more people now beginning to become employers directly um, and I suppose I'm sure one of the questions that must be asked there is what what happens if the, we decide that we need to finish up or we're making a change and there's redundancy associated with it and it's often a big concern maybe for people as to what this is going to cost when it comes to um, we'll say parting company with a person uh, hopefully in in kind of good terms obviously but what are the redundancy requirements? And again, this is something that you'll often hear on the radio, obviously, that the statutory versus what companies will actually voluntarily give in some cases can vary as well. So statutory requirements in terms of redundancy are what? So the statutory redundancy payment is two weeks gross pay per year of service, which is capped at €600 Euro per week, plus one week's pay, which is also capped at €600. Euro. So this is a tax-free payment. So two weeks pay for each year of service plus one week. Okay, so basically if somebody was working with you for five years, they'd be entitled to 10 weeks plus one week. Yeah. Okay, and, and that wouldn't come to more than, obviously that would be 10 weeks at 600 plus the 600. That's uh, 6,600 or something. So it's actually, okay, it's a si- it's a sizable sum of money, but it re- re- relatively speaking, it's not something that should be or people should be overly concerned about really if you no longer have work for an employee or their position ceases ceases to exist this is a redundancy situation so sometimes you might be closing down the business or sometimes you might just be reducing the number of employees that you have employed any employee that's over 16 years of age with 104 weeks of continuous service is entitled to a statutory redundancy payment so important to bear that in mind as well and then I suppose, again, this time of year, people are looking for all help that they can avail of. And some of the under 18s are great at stepping into the void here. So people that are maybe 16 plus, and I suppose maybe you might just uh, um, indicate what's the legal requirement or maybe is there a legal requirement in terms of the minimum age that a person should be. But what's the situation with paying under 18s? Are they entitled to minimum wage or what's the, the story with them? So there are different rates of pay for people who are under 20. Um but young people are people who are aged between 14 to 16. And there are uh, many different rules and regulations around their employment to protect them. So as as young workers are generally in full-time employment, they are protected by different laws than those to adults. This is to make sure that their work does not put their health or their education at risk. So for example, there are different rate, uh, age limits for employment. There are different maximum working hours. There are different hours around uh, or bans around doing late night work. There are additional break times that you have to give them. And there are also additional records that employers must keep if they are employing somebody under 18. The, my best advice is to um, have a look at the WRC under 18s poster. This must also be displayed if you are employing anybody under 18. And this outlines all the different rules and regulations around employing young people. OK, so um, there's a lot of intricacies in associated with this that people maybe not be very conscious of. And I suppose we haven't actually looked at even the pay side of things there either, Clarissa, or we haven't spoken about it yet. Like what, like that's changed quite dramatically. I mean, the idea of giving a young fella 50 quid for doing a job has kind of gone out the window, really. Like these people need to be on a payroll as well. Um, and that's something that people need to be very cognizant of as well. Do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, just want to make sure that, you know, um, people are also entitled to receive pay slips. So it is really important that people are on the payroll and that they're paying gross pay instead of net. That's one that we would get um, often as well. Um, and to make sure that they are issuing pay slips. This is another thing that the WRC will look like, will look for if they come in for an audit. So that's just to clarify, I suppose, what you're saying when you talk about gross pay is that if you're agreeing to pay 50 euro, 
that's what you're actually paying whereas in a lot of cases people when they say oh it's 50 euro they're expecting to get the 50 euro into their hand and that means that you're actually paying possibly somewhere in the region of 60 euro maybe or a little bit with it because generally speaking it's probably somewhere in around around 25 percent on top of what the person is actually getting net is from what i've seen figures before so people just need to it, it the headline figure is actually a gross pay figure and it's very important that people I, I presume you've obviously seen people getting caught with that have you exactly so it'll depend on the employee's tax credits which can change um and then that cost will be on the employer so to avoid that it's always best to agree a gross figure and to include that in the contract of employment and I suppose finally then just to pick up on a piece, I suppose, in terms of more longer term, so huge issues in uh, the labour market in Ireland in general, in every sector, uh, and a lot of talk of um, foreign workers coming in. So foreign workers have come in from the EU in the past and there's no problem with them. They obviously, through the EU uh, or, or EU participation, that they have free movement within the EU. But there are permits required for for, uh, for people coming from further afield um the damien english actually allowed for more permits to be issued there before christmas but that's not a quick fix for anyone that's now thinking that they're calving cows next week and that they're going to get somebody through this permit route so it's maybe a more longer term scenario so would you just explain we'll say about the time frame that's involved in it and maybe uh, without na- listing out all the countries but where will people have to be considering work permits for people that they might be bringing in yeah, so more and more people are bringing people into Ireland from abroad or from a non-EEA country. They are, there's so many people that are experiencing recruitment challenges at the moment. So we've seen a significant uptake in these applications. So any employee that's from outside the EEA requires a permit to work in Ireland. So that's the EU plus Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, UK or Switzerland. So any employee that's outside any of those countries requires a permit. It's really, it is really important that if you have somebody from outside those countries that they are on a on a permit to work. It is the most serious um, thing that the WRC look for if during an inspection. So that is a criminal offence. They take that the most serious. It's, it's an immediate fine. Um, so the general employment permit allows. Um, people to work in occupations where there is a labour shortage in Ireland. So there are a few steps that you need to take and a few elements that you need to bear in mind when applying for the permit. So the first thing is the rate of pay is 30,000 at 39 hour week. The title or the type of work can't be on the list of ineligible occupations. So it needs to be where there are work shortages or where the government have identified labour shortages in Ireland. Then a labour market needs test needs to be carried out by the employer. So this is essentially proof that they have advertised within Ireland and within the EU and that they're unable to recruit here. So this labour market needs test involves three different types of advertisement and it takes 28 days. Once you have the labour market needs test complete, you can then start your permit application the processing times vary greatly. So it isn't a quick fix. And I know you touched on that, Stuart. Um, They can take anywhere from three to six months to be processed before you have a decision. And it's never 100% guarantee that you're going to be granted the permit either. They they can also be declined. Um, I think this is really useful for people for long-term planning. It's really important now, especially that we're experiencing so many labour shortages um, that people start planning for the future as well. So even if this is something for next year that people are starting starting to consider and prepare for. Just to uh, kind of the testing of the market there, we'll say, or the advertising that has to be done. I've seen those ads actually on the journal and so forth. We'll say the 39 hour a week, maximum 30,000. It's kind of obviously kind of a statutory requirement to advertise it that way. Uh, if people actually respond to that from within the EEA and the other countries that you've mentioned there, and and then you deem them not to be suitable for the position that you have 
are you still eligible to apply for a permit then or what way does that work because it sounds like if you get an expression of interest you're almost done for in terms of going for a permit nearly no so if someone does apply and they're not suitable it doesn't affect the application at all so as part of the labor market needs test you need to advertise on the URA's platform for 28 days and then you need to advertise for three days in a national paper and a further three days in a local paper or a different online jobs platform if you do receive applications for that and they're not suitable that is fine if you receive applications and they are suitable well that's great because you might be able to bring somebody in quicker than the person that you have um from abroad and um, what the permit application involves is just proof that you have advertised it for these lengths of time so they don't want to see who has applied or how many applications or interviews that you've done okay or received yeah very good so look i suppose just to wrap it up clarissa um and like this is a busy time now as i said we've really kicked off now on farms in most parts of the country at this stage like what are the three key things that people need to do and maybe it's just one key thing maybe it's ring clarissa is, is the answer to, to this but what are the three t- key things that people need to have in place in relation to employees on their farms i think it's really important that people are starting to become more aware of their obligations as an employer and review their situation have a look at what they have in place and what they don't have in place and how compliant that they are the agri sector was largely non-compliant last year in the wrc report from 2021 so it is really important that people are becoming more compliant and putting contracts and so on in place the main things when when a wrc inspection occurs they will usually always ask for contracts of employment, a copy of a disciplinary and a grievance procedure, uh, copies of timesheets or records of working hours and pay slips. And then depending if you have people from outside the EEA, they'll require the permits. If you have young people under 18, they'll require additional documentation as well. But they are a quick synopsis of the main elements that will always be required. So there's there's a lot. It's a, you know, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot that people need to consider when it comes to compliance. So I would strongly recommend that if somebody is struggling on this, that they do seek professional advice just to get everything sorted. Very good. And I think it's probably just a, a very good general synopsis that people just seek professional advice for areas that they're not strong on. And m- most people will not be strong on this area because I'm almost baffled by some of the figures and, and numbers that you've mentioned there in terms of days of leave, etc., and how they're calculated. So it, it's not a simple system. So people should take your advice and, and seek advice. So thanks very much, Clarissa, for coming on. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you. That's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Age podcast. And my thanks to Clarissa O'Nulan for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.